One of the candidates for the powerful position of New York City Controller will be my guest in this program. The many powerful big dollar responsibilities of the city controller that affect you and I and all New Yorkers include overseeing New York's $160 billion pension system and approving New York City contracts. Also in this program, I'll be chatting with a Brooklyn real estate broker about the lifting of the moratorium on evictions. The financial responsibilities of the New York City Controller are monstrous. In fact, some people would say humongous. Brian Benjamin, you're running for Controller. Welcome to Brooklyn 45. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. There are many New Yorkers who have no idea of the power of the City Controller. So let's begin there. Talk to me about the power of this position you are running for. First of all, thank you, Sam, for, for actually bringing this up, because one of the things that uh, we are trying to do is, as, as candidates and as uh, qualified candidates is make sure that our community knows what the comptroller actually does. So first and foremost, the comptroller is the chief investment officer of the $250 billion pension uh, assets that represent over five different funds, about 700,000 retirees and soon to be retirees. And the job of the comptroller is to ensure that those funds are managed in a way that the retirees can get their defined benefit uh, returns checks every month. Because if the pension fund system doesn't work, the city of New York, that means the taxpayers of New York are on the hook. The taxpayers of New York will have to fund and finance the retirees' pension assets if the, if the fund doesn't work. And I'm the only candidate in this race who has pension um, uh, management experience. Um, um, I've actually managed investments before um, after Brown and Harvard Business School, I managed money at Morgan Stanley. So that's an important point. Secondly, as you mentioned, the comptroller also approves contracts. We register all city contracts and make sure people get paid. You know, when, when, when uh, municipal workers get paid, it's the comptroller's name was on their check. So the way in which people feed their families throughout the city system is the comptroller and if the comptroller decides not to register contracts that could have serious implications uh, for uh, a number of city uh, agencies that have uh, provided uh, uh, sort of responsibilities and services to third party vendors. Comptroller is also responsible for auditing and or investigating any city expenditure. So any, every city agency is supposed to be audited uh, once every four years, but then some, not a, not a full audit, it could be an audit of you know, particular size. Uh, and that includes agencies like the New York Police Department, uh, the Department of Education, the New York City um, Housing Authority. Every city agency uh, has to be held accountable because the comptroller ultimately, Sam, is the chief accountability officer to, for New York City, the, the, the comptroller make sure that every city expenditure uh, is getting uh, sort of uh, managed and, and spent in a way that provides results for the, for the, for the taxpayers and, and, and the citizens of New York City. And you need someone who's experienced to play that role. And I have that experience. Uh, those responsibilities are enormous. Absolutely. We said humongous. We <laughs> said monstrous. <laughs> On your website, uh, you said that there are two goals that you have in mind. Let's talk about those two goals. Yeah, so one of the things I want to make sure that we do is uh, we provide real affordable housing um, to the people of New York. So, you know, the comptroller has the power to invest resources, and I want to make sure that we deal with this affordable housing crisis uh, we provide affordable home ownership, affordable housing, and uh, an answer to the homelessness crisis uh, by, with permanent housing uh, for those who need it. And then secondarily, I want to make sure that there, we reimagine public safety and we ensure that law enforcement's role within that is, is something that is uh, responsible and appropriate. You know, as we think about public safety and police accountability, it's important that we do both things. And so as comptroller, I'd like to audit the NYPD's budget to make sure that the money is being spent uh, from a perspective of keeping us safe uh, and not 
to, um, to, to harm communities. You know, bad police officers need to be rooted out of the system. And that's something that a good comptroller can help manage. And I look forward to doing that. You know, I'm, I'm the son of Caribbean immigrants. My mother's from Guyana. My dad is from Jamaica. And, you know, I, we, they came to this country with two suitcases and a dream, Sam. And, you know, now I sit here, well-educated, running to be the next New York City comptroller. It's because of, uh, of the, 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 their, their efforts and their focus and their desire uh, to help make this, this possible. I wanna make sure that every New York City uh, child has the same opportunities that I have and the city system has to work on their behalf. And that's what I look to do. Mm -hmm. Helping people to realize their dream, Absolutely. whether they're immigrants or whether they were born here. I was born here, so I'm, I was born in Harlem. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm the son of, immig of immigrants, yes. How are you doing with fundraising? Oh, good question. So I, uh, we are now uh, uh, raised over $3 million in this campaign. Three. Uh, we already have an ad, $3 million um, we've raised. We've had, we have an ad on television. We are, uh, we have a, a, a robust staff. Uh, we have, uh, we have an operation citywide. So we are running to win. Uh, and, you know, you have to raise the money. Um, you know, I got into this race later than most of my competitors, and it's been a mad dash and sprint for me, but I've done what I need to do. We have enough money to get our message out to make sure that voters know that I am a candidate, I'm a candidate in this race, uh, and that I'm a candidate who can win. And that you're a serious candidate. They said that money talks. <laughs> money does talk. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm very very committed to is educating people, right? Because the, ultimately the, the, the job of the controller is to provide transparency uh, to everyone. And I'm running on a platform of equity and fairness. I want to make sure that there's equity in how we spend the resources, uh, but, and, and also fairness and, and how we uh, distribute the resources. So I'll give you a perfect example. If you look across the diaspora, the Caribbean, Africa, we don't spend, we don't have $1 invested in the Caribbean or Africa, not $1. Meanwhile, we have money invested in other parts of the world. Uh, and in you know, 2018, the, the Jamaican Stock Exchange was the number one performing stock exchange in the world, on the planet Earth. Wow. And we have not figured out how to invest in, in, the, in, the, in the Black diaspora. Uh, that's a shame. And then we're not investing at home in, in our small businesses and our entrepreneurship class. There are a lot of great opportunities, a lot of great entrepreneurs in our communities who need those resources. This is a public pension fund, Sam. It's not a private pension fund. I, you know, I sit on the board of trustees at Brown University, the endowment that has done very well over the last 10 years. That's not the same as this. You know, these are these are black and brown people whose um, these are whose assets we're managing. We should make sure that it's helping to build a better society for all of us. You said earlier you are being taken very seriously. You've raised a lot of money. Let's talk about endorsements. What are these? I, I, I've seen that you've got some phenomenal endorsements. Talk I, about some of them. Thank you. So I'm fortunate, you know, former Governor David Patterson has endorsed my campaign. Uh, former state comptroller, Carl McCall, has endorsed my campaign. Just last week, former city comptroller, John Liu, endorsed my campaign yesterday former Congressman Charles B. Rangel, the line of Lenox Avenue, endorsed my campaign. Uh, the Bronx Democratic Party has endorsed my campaign. We have Senator Roxanne Prasad, uh, Assemblymember Jamie Williams have endorsed my campaign. Senator John uh, James Sanders, Councilmember Danique Miller. When you look across the city, we have endorsements from one part of um, New York City to the, to, to the, to the other, and we have what we need to win this race. And so I feel very good about the money we've raised, the endorsement rate, the laborers we've, we've received, and the fact that I'm the most qualified candidate in this race. You know, uh, if, if I had the record that some of my competitors had as a black person, I couldn't even run. You know, we, we, we are hard on each, on, our, <laughs> on each other more than we are on other people in other communities. And, and, um, and that's, that's okay because, you know, I always learned as a young man, as I'm sure you have, Sam, you always have to be twice as good and work twice as hard to, to, in, order to, to, in order to achieve. And so I'm, I'm prepared to do that and I get that. Uh, but we are running an amazing campaign. It's a, it's a well-funded campaign. 
Uh, you know, I'm out every day. Uh, I do train stations. I'm, I zigzag the city. I was in four boroughs today. I'll be in three tomorrow. Four, four um, on Friday. I, I do five to six churches a weekend. You know, we we are we are running the wind. And as we get closer to the finish line, we're going to make sure that that New York City residents know that I'm a candidate in this race. I'm running, and and you know I will do well um, by the pension funds, and I'll be a great chief accountability officer for the city of New York. You talk a little bit about your vision, but talk some more about your vision for New York City. Well, the first part of the vision is to make sure that I have a good working relationship with the mayor. You know, as you know, there has been um, a lot of to do around the mayor's relationship with the governor and the mayor's relationship with the comptroller and everyone is fighting. We need to be collaborative. The mayor, the comptroller and the governor need to be working together to help make sure that New York recovery is strong, it's stable, uh, it's sustainable. And so I want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, you know, I want to make sure uh, that within that, I'm playing the important role of tracking all of the spending. Uh, we have billions of dollars that are coming from COVID spending uh, from the federal government to the city. I want to make sure that that money is being spent in a way where uh, we're getting the real recovery that we need from that. We're helping to bring students um, back up to speed. We're helping to uh, reopen Broadway, bring back tourism. Um, you know, a lot of our communities, particularly in Harlem, rely on tourism uh, for, the, for the general economy. And so I wanna make sure that all of that kind of activity is happening. Our small businesses are not, are not getting fined to death um, as they're just trying to get going again. Uh, and the comptroller can play an important role of providing information and access and, our, uh, uh, and, and helping to be an ambassador. It's a bully pulpit we have, Sam, an ambassador for uh, our small businesses who have been hurt during this process and, and help reopen New York. The city controller is not a very visible position at all. Uh, do you plan to try to change that? Absolutely. I think that one of the things that the comptroller's office has, you have a $70 million budget, over 700 staff members. We should be doing way more activity as it relates to having uh, uh, you know, uh, more video conferences, more, more information that's easily digestible. We don't wanna have a dense website. We want a website that people can get access to for their particular topics. You know, I am very happy to use the bully pulpit, but on issues that people care about, you know, police accountability, public safety, uh, homelessness, uh, education, the big topic items, we should be making sure that there's accountability across the board. COVID spending, that is the kind of future that I'm looking to, to lead and that one where I am best situated and best prepared uh, and most experienced to ensure that the city of New York gets the support that it needs as we build out of COVID. This is not the time for someone new who doesn't know what they're doing. It's time for someone experienced who can get the job done. Thank you. I have to ask you about ranked choice voting. This is the first year for that. Uh, how does this help your campaign? And um, how do you feel about ranked choice voting? And what have your, the persons that you've been seeing every day, what are they asking you about ranked choice voting? So ranked choice voting, uh, I believe, helps my campaign tremendously because I do believe I'm the most qualified candidate. And you know, people uh, want to make sure, even if they have a variety of reasons, uh, some other candidate as their number one choice, uh, uh, I could be the second choice or I'm their number one choice. And uh, we, are, you know, we are doing a great job of making sure that people know that I'm out there, I'm qualified, I can get the job done. And I look forward uh, to, uh, to, to winning this race under the ranked choice voting system. Senator Brian Benjamin running for New York City Controller. I want to thank you for being my guest here on Brooklyn 45. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. There are many tenants who will tell you that they are facing an eviction crisis. Some will tell you that it's New York rent laws that are to be blamed for this. My guest is real estate broker Raul Rasoon. Raul, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to this meeting and um, I appreciate you and all that you are doing for Brooklyn 45 and also the staff. 
Yes, yep. uh, and also for our Brooklyn community. But let's talk about the Brooklyn community who are concerned about this eviction crisis. How do you respond to that? Yeah, this is a big situation and um, uh, definitely a problem that um, not only is Brooklyn and New York City facing, but the whole United States. Uh, there's a lot of opinions, a lot of debates that's going on pertaining to this moratorium crisis. And actually this moratorium crisis is really, um, just so you guys would know, it's called the COVID Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act, which was passed in 2020. Now, it has recently been extended to August 31st, and I'm going to give you uh, different sides of the argument, and I'll start with the landlord first. Now, pertaining to be to pertain to it pertaining um, to the fact that it has been extended to August 31st, a lot of landlords are concerned that the government um, will also extend it again, and the reason being is that around August, we're going more into the winter months. And as a lot of people may know, evictions is not really a popular thing when it goes into the holiday season. So landlords are concerned that it's gonna spill over into 2022. And that could mean more um, damages financial wise uh, for landlords. And that's a concern. Now, just a few facts and statistics um, um, that I wanna share with you. There's about 44 million rental units in the United States. And out of that 44 million, 24 million is really independently owned by landlords, which means landlords that owns two to four units. Um, the concern uh, for these small landlords uh, is that they're losing. Uh, not only are tenants not paying rent, there are tenants that are not paying rent and they're also going to work on a daily basis. Um, that's an argument that a lot of the landlords are making, which is factual and, and there's proof for that. But we understand that because of the pandemic, there are people who lost their job and yes, um, it is important and essential for us to sympathize with them and to work with them to the best of um, our ability, uh, both government, um, private, nonprofit, um, all spectrum, um, of society, but at the same time, to take advantage of a situation just because you can, um, you know, is it, wrong. Because what happened is it's a domino effect. So if a tenant, for example, is going to work, they're making an income and they're not able to pay their rent, that landlord is not able to pay the mortgage, which therefore affects the bank, which therefore affects how the bank lends to consumers. Um, as far as uh, credit, and it's a domino effect all around. It's, just consider the circle of life, for example. Um, each part of that circle plays a role to make society a better place. Uh, just a few other things before I go to um, the explanation and the reasoning uh, for tenants, um, if I may. The Center on Budget and Policy Procedure um, says as of March, there are 11.9 million people in the United States that is behind on rent payments. That's 11.9. An argument that the landlords are also making is they understand that we are going through a pandemic, but what is the government doing besides saying moratorium on evictions to assist the landlords? Are they cutting taxes? No, they're not. Are they giving uh, subsidy to the landlords to help them to pay for utilities, which the tenants are using on a daily basis? That could cover water and sewage. That can cover gas, which is for heat and hot water, and um, many other different things as well. Some landlords include light with the rent. You know, these are factors and points that the landlords are arguing about plus many more, but on the flip side, let's look at the tenant situation. Um, the biggest thing is that there is a pandemic. And if you evict people and you put them out there, statistics has shown that there will be an increase in COVID cases, which would result in an increase of deaths, 
And that also affects the circle of life. So either way you look at it from either spectrum, we're looking at society as a whole being affected. So we are definitely in this together. I think what we have to all look at is, yes, we're facing a pandemic, which is we haven't seen in God knows how long, and that's affecting everything around us. But I think every individual need to take responsibility for what they're supposed to do. If a tenant is working, they should pay the rent. If a landlord is getting rent from a tenant, they should pay their mortgage because we all have to come out of this hole um, together. And if we each, if different people take advantage of the situation, we dig in a deeper hole for ourselves. Raul, you are a broker. Do you represent both tenants and landlords? Yes, we do. We definitely represent both tenants and landlords. Um, so what are you saying to your tenants? Well, tenants that in come- of their, In terms of their responsibilities. Right, right, I, I totally understand. Well, I mean, once we connect a tenant with a landlord, uh, we definitely explain to tenants that it's their fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the rent is um, paid in a timely manner um, because of the fact that the landlord is renting them a unit um, legally, um, and the landlord is looking uh, forward to that rent being paid so they can also take care of their bills. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a fact out there that a lot of people feel that landlords are getting wealthy from rent, but there's so much overhead that landlords have. Um, we have mortgage, um, you have utilities, and you have maintenance. So that's what I tell uh, my tenants. And that comes to us to rent apartment. And the landlords, what are you saying to them? I mean, they understand what the challenges are. What are you saying to them and what are they saying to you? Right. A lot of landlords are concerned about the moratorium, for example. And they're so concerned that I've gotten uh, numerous landlords tell me, um, Raul, to be honest with you, um, the government right now is controlling the housing market. And I rather wait to rent my apartment. I rather keep it vacant until this moratorium passes over uh, because I'm afraid that if I put someone in my rental apartment, they will not pay even if they are working. And this is the reason why I say that each of us, tenant and landlord, have a fiduciary duty to do the right thing because when you don't do the right thing, um, it affects us all. What is the vacant situation in Brooklyn? The vacant situation in Brooklyn, um, I would have to say that out of the three units that are available, you're probably looking at one unit that a landlord it would wait for the moratorium to pass over. Unless there's an exception, which means that you can prove the individual landlord that a potential tenant is responsible and that they will pay the rent and that they will step up to their fiduciary duty. And that's the situation that I'm seeing on a daily basis. It is getting better, obviously because the vaccine is out and New York City is starting to open up. So landlords are starting to feel, okay, you know, I could take more of a chance and more of a risk with a tenant with not 100% so good credit compared to a tenant which is an A credit tenant. So these things are starting to loosen up a little bit, but at the same time, you could still feel the, the tensity um, in the market. So we don't have a, a, a situation that is acceptable to both tenants and landlords? Not currently but we're definitely getting there. And that's our responsibility as brokers to make sure that both the tenants and the landlord have an understanding prior to signing their, on the dotted line of that lease, yes. that they're comfortable and they understand each other. And uh, moving forward, there would not be any issues. Okay. Raul Van Rossum, I thank you very much for the enlightening information you have provided to our viewers today. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay.
Thank you, Raul Rasum. And we invite you who have watched this program to partner with us here at Brooklyn 45. You can do this in several ways. You can suggest topics, you can suggest issues like this or other issues you want us to provide information about. And you can go to our website, www.brooklyn45.com and become a supporter. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit community television program. That means when you support us, our communities benefit as well, and so do you. Um, you benefit on your taxes and you benefit in so many other ways. So please support us and tell everyone you know on your social media network about us. On behalf of Brooklyn 45 and our entire Brooklyn 45 team, Brooklyn 45 is a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we welcome your support. Check out our website, brooklyn45.com, and feel free to donate or share it with your friends and family. Have any comments or questions? Send them to our Facebook, facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. If you have any questions or topics you think we should cover next, shoot me an email over at brooklyn45tv at gmail.com. Thank you again for watching.